So it makes no sense to have a system to hold people accountable to make these financial payments when they can never be held accountable. It just solely becomes a permanent punishment for people who are poor in our society. Welcome to New Thinking from the Center for Court Innovation. I'm Matt Watkins. If you've ever had an encounter with the criminal justice system, chances are it came with a price tag. First is the fine associated with any conviction. If it's a felony, that can easily be upwards of $1,000, and that's in addition to any time in jail or prison. Then there are the fees collected at almost every step of the process. Various states charge for using a public defender, for a DNA sample, for a drug test, for a diversion program, for your monthly parole meetings, even for a jury trial. When you fall behind on those payments, in some jurisdictions you'll be hit with interest and surcharges. Court systems often contract private collection agencies who, wait for it, also bill you for their work. And when you can't pay, you could end up in jail. Fines and fees are capturing millions of Americans in a cycle of poverty and justice involvement. And today we're going to hear from two people who are both working to lessen their impact. In the second part of the show, you'll hear from Alexis Harris. She is perhaps the leading researcher on how fines and fees are used across the country. But first up is Edmonds Municipal Court Judge Linda Coburn from Washington State. She's come up with an innovative solution to the problem of fines and fees, or as she calls them, LFOs. And that stands for Legal Financial Obligations, and please remember that acronym. Prior to joining the bench, Judge Coburn was a public defender, and I started our conversation by asking her how much she realized then about the impacts of LFOs on her clients. I would always make an argument to, for the courts to not impose any mandatory fines and fees. And I think for those who are on the extreme end of indigency, that wasn't a problem. But I also represented the working poor. In other words, they weren't completely destitute, but uh, they were barely making ends meet. And for some circumstances, I think um, legal financial obligations were imposed. And I don't think I really realized the long-term impact it had on those defendants because the focus was always on avoiding jail, trying to get the charges reduced. And so even though you had clients who wants to please the court and say, I can pay payments of $50 a month or $25 a month, you don't necessarily really understand in their circumstances what they're giving up in order to do that or how long it's going to take them to actually pay off the LFOs and, and, and what implications that, that 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 may mean. Well, what would you say then that you are understanding now better, and, and, and how did you come to that understanding? Well, I think after coming and becoming a judge and being on the bench, realizing my role of when I'm imposing it and what are all the laws that are applicable regarding what is mandatory, what um, can be waived, what can be suspended, what exactly am I assessing for? And also having a better understanding of this person's going to take five years to pay off what I'm considering imposing, eight years to pay off, four years to pay off, whatever it may be. And is that what I intended? I think there's a pressure on judges to conduct sentencing and, and hear as many cases as they can in as short amount of time as they can. So and I don't know whether... Um, it's intentional or not intentional. I can tell you right now, I can give you an example that I had a pro tem judge in my court who had imposed a high amount of legal financial obligations, but allowed for a very nominal monthly payment. And I talked to her and I said, hey, did you realize how long it would take this person to pay this off? And when I did the math for her, she was stunned. And that's an example where she didn't intend that. And if she had known that, she may have revisited what under the law she had the authority to adjust regarding discretionary LFOs. But because she wanted to have the hearing done, move on to the next hearing, she didn't take the time to do the math. Right. So you've, you've talked about how when you were a public defender and perhaps when you started out as a judge, you didn't have a, a full uh, appreciation of, of the impact of fines and fees. Now that you have this deeper appreciation, at just how big of a role do you see fines and fees playing in, in, in the justice system as a whole? I think it plays a huge role. In the state of Washington, we are one of the, if not the lowest, funded court system in the country. 
we do not have dedicated funding for our court systems. They are funded by the local jurisdictions. So there is this inherent creation of the money that is being collected through the courts as being viewed as revenue. And so that creates this difficult dynamic and pressure, whether it's sometimes explicit from the legislative branch of the government or whether it's implicit, like regardless of what you say, everybody knows the dollar amount you are collecting is going into a fund that therefore is going to pay for the courts. Well, I, I guess I take it you're, you're saying that the fact that jurisdictions are, are using fines and fees to fund their own operations has, certainly has the potential to set up a kind of perverse incentive to go out there and try to gather more fines and fees. Yes, and, and, that, and that shouldn't be the case, right? So when somebody's before me and I'm sentencing them, I should consider their charge, their criminal history, what are the facts and circumstances of the case, their financial situation and their ability to pay and determine what is just and fair. What I shouldn't consider is, well, I need to make sure that my clerk gets paid. I need to make sure that I get paid. I need to make sure that we have money to turn the lights on at the court, and that's why I'm going to impose this amount. I think that creates an inherent conflict of interest. So, it, you know, it, it sounds to me like what you're describing is a, a situation where fines and fees are really integral to the justice system. They're, in fact, a major way that many justice systems are funding their own operations. Uh, and yet, for years now, judges and attorneys haven't really been properly trained in the ramifications of these fines and fees, and people are sort of regarding them as kind of the fine print of a sentence, whereas, in fact, they can be uh, sometimes the most onerous part of a sentence. And, and I would say, in some regards, I don't think that it's they're necessarily naive of sometimes it's going to take them a long time to pay. But I do think the education is not just being educated on the ramifications of the long-term effects, but literally being educated on what the law is, really understanding what the LFO is and whether you have authority to impose it or not or reduce it or waive it or whether you even prohibit it from imposing it to begin with. They don't teach you about LFOs in law school, but I think if you're relying on the attorneys to always get it right, I think what's going to happen is that there will be instances where nobody gets it right. So, I, I, I mean, I think you've given us a really good sense of the complexity of these laws that would uh, sort of escape any one person's comprehension, it sounds like. Um, you, though I understand, have, have come up with a, a sort of innovative solution, potentially, to, to this problem. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit about this uh, uh, calculator that, that you've helped create? The whole purpose of this calculator is to make it available to judges, um, defense attorneys, prosecutors, advocates, whoever that may be. So it will be at your fingertip to really understand if this is the crime, then what are the LFOs that could be associated with that crime? or must be associated with that crime. And within each of those um, LFOs, what are, is it mandatory? Can you waive it? Can you reduce it? And also letting you see what the total amount is, allowing you to add, for example, probation assessments, and understanding what that means as far as the defendant and their ability to pay that off in a reasonable amount of time. So you're able to integrate into it a given person's financial ability, so to speak. Yeah, so if somebody comes before me and they tell me that they're, for example, on state assistance, right? The calculator is going to remind me that if they're on state assistance, then they are by law determined to be indigent. If they're determined to be indigent and I select that category on the calculator, it will automatically lock out costs. It will prohibit me from selecting them because by law in Washington, we are prohibited from imposing costs on defendants who are indigent. That's a recent law, right? That is a change that just took place last year in Washington State? Yes, it went into effect in June of 2018. So that was a very big change in the law. Prior to that law, there was a requirement that courts consider ability to pay before imposing costs. But the law was written to where they consider your current and future ability to pay. And so in some instances, what would happen is somebody would say, well, I'm on food stamps now. And courts would say, all right, but you could get a job tomorrow. So therefore, I'm not finding you indigent. 
Do you have a sense of, of how the calculator has um, affected, say, the, the amounts that you're um, imposing on people, whether those amounts have uh, on the whole gone up or gone down, for example? I think I'm able to do a much more thorough analysis and take into consideration somebody's financial ability and how I can make adjustments. So I think I would say yes. I think I have been less inclined to previously where I think I imposed two hundred dollars inclusive and then let the clerks break down what that represents. Whereas now I break down what that represents and I understand what that means and I can make the adjustments because it's the judge that has the responsibility to exercise that discretion, not the clerks. Yes, that sounds like an and I, I should say that I have colleagues here at the center who uh, work with you guys as as part of the uh, um, Bureau of Justice Assistance Grant on, on this calculator that, w- you know, we offer some assistance um, through that grant. But it, it sounds like, if I've got this right, that your effort uh, really is to make the fines and fees process more transparent, basically, to everybody. And, and by doing that, make the process more intentional so people actually know what they're doing. Yes, Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's very challenging for attorneys and judges out there to be able to understand and remember all the different LFOs for all these different crimes. I can tell you nobody can do that. It's, it's not possible. So by law, if we're required to take in somebody's ability to pay and make sure that the payment plan is reasonable, which is what case law has stated, how are we supposed to do that without some type of assistance and help? And then I, I realize that you're a, a judge, and so you're, you're perhaps limited in how you can answer this question, but do you have your own sense of just what kind of role you think fines and fees should be playing in a equitable justice system? I can say that the legislature determines, obviously, the laws that they pass. That is not my role. But I can say that I believe that courts should be adequately have dedicated funding so that it doesn't create an inherent pressure on our system for judges to feel, whether it's explicit or implicit, the pressure to impose LFOs on somebody who really doesn't have the ability to pay. I mean, that, that must be a lousy feeling as a judge, no, to be handing down a sentence and realizing as you do it, this person's n- never going to be able to pay this. Yes, it, it is. In some cases, there's mandatory... LFOs that we must impose. And we look at this person, we look at their history, and do we think that that's going to be able to be paid? Um, No. And it's not always because it's out of being stubborn or willful, but out of, you know, the facts and circumstances of their case, the long-term health, uh, you know, mental health issues that they have, the substance abuse issues that they're struggling with and trying to deal with. The fact that they're homeless and they have no place to to live or, you know, struggling to figure out when their next meal is. But you know what? For some LFOs, that may not matter, that I may be required to impose it. That was Washington State Municipal Court Judge Linda Coburn. And there's a link to the Ability to Pay calculator she helped design on our website. Go to courtinnovation.org slash newthinking. Next up is Alexis Harris. She is a professor of sociology at the University of Washington and the author of the 2016 book, A Pound of Flesh, Monetary Sanctions as Punishment for the Poor. It's a detailed study of fines and fees practices in Washington State. And Professor Harris is currently heading up a multi-year research project comparing those practices across eight states. You can look for results from that work funded by Arnold Ventures within the next year or so. I began by asking Professor Harris whether there are generalizations we can make about the kinds of people most often being subjected to fines and fees. Oh, definitely. I mean, we know in general the people who make contact with our systems of justice, particularly the superior courts at the felony level, tend to be uh, unemployed, underemployed, uh, low economic groups, have mental health issues, and drug and alcohol addiction. So this is already in general disproportionately a marginalized population. Um, and then we saddle them with a felony conviction, which has a host of con- uh, consequences. And then in addition to the financial debt, it makes it very, very difficult for people to be rehabilitated or reintegrated into their c- communities. Right. You're saddling people with these large debts at the same time that they have a 
felony conviction, which is preventing them from getting the kind of employment that would allow them to pay the fee. Exactly. And some employers these days are looking at credit uh, scores, right? So <laughs> there's a direct relationship to how this debt can affect or impact negatively people's ability to access uh, employment. Um, and I definitely saw it in the work that I did in my book that it impacted people's ability to find housing, secure, safe housing, um, to get access to vehicles or loans, things like that. It just creates these huge barriers. And it's ironic because the state policymakers that set these laws, they purposefully, this isn't a collateral consequence. This is a purposeful consequence that our policymakers have created for individuals who make contact with our systems of justice. And it's completely counter to everything that we know as sociologists, as criminologists, about what people need to do or the types of supports and and circumstances that people need to have post-incarceration and conviction in order to be successful and move forward with their lives. And how much has the practice of of fines and fees, uh, how how much has it grown in in recent decades? So my argument in my book is that the result of mass conviction and incarceration, we've seen states in the 90s and the early 2000s dramatically expand the numbers of fines and fees and the amount, the number of types of fines and fees that can be imposed and the amounts of fines and fees that can be imposed. Um, my argument is that local jurisdictions and state jurisdictions just realize that they can't afford the cost of, of our mass system of criminal justice. So we've always had fines associated with our criminal justice system since its inception. But this is a a more recent phenomenon that it seems that policymakers have been saying, oh, we can't afford what we're doing. 100% of our our general fund is going to be towards criminal justice costs. How can we decrease the costs? And instead of thinking outside the box and saying, well, how can we decrease the numbers of people we're bringing in, um, they're saying, well, let's just charge the people we're bringing in without logically thinking that through and recognizing that they have a, a population that is severely hindered in their ability to be successful in society. And that's why they're making contact with the systems of justice in the first place. So, so the system is using the fines and fees to some extent to, to fund itself. I mean, beyond the kind of perverse incentive that that provides a justice system. I mean, how profitable is that? (laughs) There's no fiscal accounting system that allows one like myself to dig in and really map out where that money goes. So in order to really figure this out, we have to have jurisdictions that are willing to open their books and help us understand how much are you really recovering? How much are you spending on collections and sanctioning sanctioning for non-payment? And then uh, how much are you sort of generating to put back into your to your local government? So we're, we're digging into this now. I, I don't think it is, is very profitable. I challenge you to find any municipal or county clerk that can detail this out for you, because I don't think the local jurisdictions know what's happening. Yeah, I mean, it stands to reason, doesn't it, that if you're trying to collect money from a lot of people who don't have very much to begin with, uh, you're probably going to spend a fair bit going after them and not get much in return, no? Right. And I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but the average payment amounts are very little, um, under $30 per open account annually in many jurisdictions in uh, the state of Washington. So the state of Washington in 2015 generated uh, $30 million, which sounds like a lot, but with, on the average $30 per open account annual payment, that means that they're they're collecting this money from people who have no money um, and a number of people across the state to generate $30 million. So it just seems like a very fruitless endeavor, getting blood from stones or drawing blood from stones. It just makes no sense uh, intuitively whatsoever in terms of um, generating money for the local jurisdictions and in terms of uh, creating public safety and in terms of supporting individuals who have done a wrong to society, have um, paid their sentence in terms of spending time in jails and prisons and having that conviction on their record, not allowing them to move forward in their lives to be successful citizens. We always hear this phrase, fines and fees together, but um, yeah. uh, could you uh, just you know, briefly explain what, what, you know, what each of them are? And, and, and then I guess the, the way that it sounds like they work together to often create this, this kind of ballooning um, sort of, I think you call it a sort of permanent fiscal sentence. Right. Uh, Permanent punishment for the poor (laughs) is what I call it. So in general, I refer to these as monetary sanctions or legal financial obligations, but there's a few buckets. So the first bucket is restitution, and that's a financial financial sentence that people are given uh, um, after conviction. And that is uh, the amount of money that is 
supposed to be directly paid towards my victim. So if I steal somebody's car and that victim had to pay insurance or whatever, um, I owe them that amount of money. So that's restitution, and that's part of your punishment. Fines uh, is also part of punishment, and theoretically it is supposed to be a punishment. It's supposed to sort of hurt the offender and create sort of set up a system where I'm not going to do that again. So if I'm speeding and I, I know I'm going to get a ticket and I get that ticket, I might not speed again because I don't want to pay that that fine. And fines are associated with a particular type of offense, maybe a $2,000 for your first drug effect, offense conviction, and then it might raise um, on subsequent convictions. And both of those are supposed to be punitive related to your punishment. Fees are user fees, user costs to use the court system. This is what our taxpayer money is actually go, should go towards in the criminal justice system. Um, but fees are for people who go through the court. You pay for a jury fee. If you d- opt for a jury to hear uh, your adjudication or adjudicate your case, you're charged for that jury. There's $200 in Washington for just paperwork and processing. I was really struck by by that one because reformers often refer to something informally called the the trial penalty, which is this notion that the system punishes you for not taking a plea deal but forcing right. them to give you an expensive trial. But this is a literal trial penalty. You you have to pay to have a jury of your peers adjudicate you that yeah, so that runs counter to all of our notions. And a lot of this runs counter to our notions of justice. Right, paying for a public defender, for example. Exactly. In in one of our counties, you pay $450 for a court-appointed attorney. You pay to enter into a review, a fiscal review. You have to pay to apply <laughs> to have a public defender. A lot of people don't realize that. You know, you can be charged for your daily uh, stay in a jail or prison. You're charged a booking fee. You're charged when you're put on probation. And I think that when people hear this, sometimes they get frustrated and think that, you know, I'm trying to romanticize people who break the law or saying don't give them any punishment. And that's, I am not saying anything like that. What I'm saying is, is that we need to create a system that allows people to be punished and recognize um, that what they've done is wrong. And that's many of the people that I've interviewed have said this. I, I know I need to be held accountable. I want to pay my restitution, um, but I can't pay these fines and fees and interest the system knows, they, oftentimes that's the word that's used, they know I'm unemployed or they know I'm going to have a hard time getting a job. So it makes no sense to have a system to hold people accountable to make these financial payments when they can never be held accountable. It just solely becomes a permanent punishment for people who are poor in our society. Yeah, I, I've I've seen, I think, the family of a young man who was assessed with all kinds of fines and fees describe it as feeling like you're drowning in a swimming pool and, right. and they just keep adding more water over top of your head. Right. I mean, that's what people say is you, they make a payment, particularly because of the interest, and hopefully this will change uh, for in the next couple of years. We'll see it. But particularly because of the interest and the additional surcharge for collections, people say, I, I make a $20 payment, but every month it just gets bigger and bigger. In some jurisdictions, the local jurisdiction, either the municipality or the county, will transfer the debt to a private collections agency. And in Washington State, that private collection agency can add 50% to that principal. So if I was, you know, I owed 2000 they could add another 1000 to that. So that's a whole other part of the story is that in every way that people are being charged from, you know, being in jail for certain things, private probation, Um, private collections, a literal captive audience has to pay in to make profits for private companies. So in your observations, how much do you think judges actually uh, understand uh, about the fines and fees system and and about the kind of uh, amounts they're imposing? I mean, it, it sometimes strikes me that sounds a bit like a rental car agreement where you you get one price that gets you into the deal and that's the price maybe that the judge is quoting you from the bench and then you go to the window and discover you know that it's four times higher and eight years later it's you know x number of times higher than that right so individuals are shocked when they get their bills and seeing it uh, balloon i i i don't think that anyone per, want any one like major decision maker so a clerk a prosecutor a judge or public defender really understands the enormity of the system of monetary sanctions i think they see their one particular role so i think you're right judge's sentence um and they may think that that's it and don't 
necessarily recognize that it's going to balloon. But I do think more and more increasingly there's been so much conversation uh, locally and, and nationally and, and you know, also within other states that judges are aware. And some, the ones that I've interviewed in Washington, there was sort of a, a, a split. Some thought that the system was counterproductive and they, they didn't want to be collection agents and they sort of recognized that the population that they were managing had a really difficult time with the debt that was going to be imposed on them. However, other judges felt that this was part of breaking the law, that, you know, you do the time, you pay the crime, <laughs> whatever whatever it is. And so other judges and prosecutors and clerks felt that this was a system of accountability. This is a, another way from a paternalistic standpoint that individuals can be held accountable and and show that they're remorseful for their crime. So even one policymaker I interviewed said that this system allows for people to every month make a payment and it, then express their remorse. And then my question is, is how long do people have to express their remorse for what they've done? For wealthy people, they, they can express it and pay it, right? And for poor people, they have to express it, you know, every month for the rest of their lives. Uh, again, it just highlights how unfair this system is. And so you've done this in a pretty close investigation of practices in um, in a collection of counties in Washington State. You're also doing some more national work. Uh, how how is there consistency at least in in the system and in, in uh, across states, say, in, in in how the system is applied? In Washington, I found this huge variation in the five counties that I I studied in the ways in which judges interpreted the state statute, applied it, and then monitored individuals. So from one end of the continuum, judges would impose it and at the minimum amounts um, and not really incarcerate unless people were uh, not paying for restitution. In other counties, anyone who owed any debt would be regularly have warrants put out for their arrest and they'd be incarcerated for up to 60 days. So it's, it's not uncommon then for people to end up in jail for being unable to meet their debts, in, in this case, a debt to the court system. No, it's not uncommon at all. And people wonder, well, we don't have debtors' prisons. but So we had the Bearden v. I'm blanking on, on Georgia case, um, which established this concept of willful nonpayment, that people could not be incarcerated solely for their inability to make payments. So what's supposed to happen, if someone has this debt, they're not making payments, the court should summon them to court. Many times, uh, again, this is a problematic system we, because, in part, we have a population that has a host of issues. Many times people won't go to court because they're fearful that they will be incarcerated. And if that happens, then people will have warrants put out for their arrest and they can be reincarcerated. In either case, and times when people come to court, and I've seen this in the courts I've observed, if they, they respond to that summons, they go to court and say, I don't have money, the judge is supposed to have a hearing to determine whether or not that the reason why they that they chose not to pay, that they had the resources not to make a payment. And if that's the case, then they can be incarcerated. That sort of standard varies from judge to judge in terms of how it's interpreted. So when I was doing my research, I saw judges ask about women's manicures. How much did you spend on that? A prosecutor told me he asked people who tell him that they can't make payments. Do you smoke cigarettes? And if you do, how many packs are you smoking a month? Uh, I literally was in a hearing and saw a judge ask a woman about her tattoos. How much did you pay for those tattoos? So judges and prosecutors are look in some spaces, I'm not saying in every court, but in some spaces, the way that they're interpre- interpreting willful um, non-payment is their own personal judgment on what people should be using their resources for. Um, and then people can be sentenced up to 60 days. One jurisdiction had a $300 pay or stay. So you pay $300 now if they're picked up on a warrant. Um, you pay $300 now or you stay for 60 days. Um, so there are there is a legal protection, but the problem is, is that our courts at the state – level have not established how judges should be interpreting the criteria by which judges should be interpreting willful nonpayment. Do you think that there is a a, a proper, I mean, I guess, more contained role for legal financial obligations within the system? Or is it your position that that the system would function better uh, pretty much without them? I don't think the general public understands the layers of 
punishments that people receive. They, they go to jail or prison, but they also have community supervision post-release. They might have community service they have to perform. They might have to have drug and alcohol assessment and treatment that they have to pay for. They might have to attend victims' classes. They might have electronic home monitoring. So there's several layers of punishment, and I argue, and in addition to that, they have the felony conviction with a host of collateral consequences. So I argue that we don't need an additional um, either fine or fee at the felony level for individuals. They have enough enough punishment at that level. Um, now, the misdemeanor and the traffic tickets are a different sort of um, issue because m many times those people aren't going to jail or prison and have these other punishment options. Um, and so what I would argue at those levels is that we need to have some sort of graduated sanction. In many other countries around the world, they find systems. And under those systems, people uh, are given and their offense has a score, a number associated with the offense that they're convicted of, and then their average daily wage is another score, and those two numbers are then multiplied. And so that number, what that gives us, uh, is the fiscal amount that they're sentenced to, and it's proportionate to the offense in terms of the severity of the offense, and it's proportionate to what the offender can pay. And then what, what did you make of this uh, recent um, unanimous, I think, Supreme Court decision um, holding that the, the Constitution's prohibition on excessive fines um, applied to the ability of state and local governments to levy fines and fees? Do you see that as, as having a significant impact? Oh, I, I'm hoping, I'm hopeful it will have a significant impact. I feel that it's, it's, it's extremely exciting that States now hopefully will start thinking about what does excessive mean, and that's another conversation we need to start having. Can our, our courts, I'm assuming, will have more sort of challenges now at the state um, of excessive fines, fees, and forfeitures um, that are being imposed on individuals, and I'm hoping our courts will start to suss out how do we define what are the criteria for what excessive means. I have also am excited to see in, in both Ginsburg and Thomas's decisions that they ta they linked excessive forfeitures with the black codes and convict uh, leasing programs. Um, and so they even recognize that a conservative Supreme Court justice recognizes how the criminal justice system has moved into an arena um, that's consistent with prior forms of abusive practices. And so I'm hoping that we can just help us uh, create more momentum to talking about these key issues and thinking through how, if we really want to be a just society like we claim we are, how can we hold people who violate the law to be accountable in a way in which they can meet that accountability, repent, <laughs> and move forward with their lives to be productive and successful, happy citizens. Yeah, I mean, from that perspective, it also seems uh, hopeful that the issue of fines and fees appears to be getting a, a, a lot more uh, attention of late, you know, in media coverage and um, and public discourse, and I, I think from criminal justice reformers as well. Do, do you ha have a sense of of what the, um, the the future could be for reforming this system? Yeah, I mean, I think it ha in my mind it has to be piecemeal, state by state has to, to occur, and we have some leaders in, in, that are making changes, um, all the way from smaller things, I mean, not just court and post, but other ways that the justice system is profiting off of individuals. So, so for example, New York um, doesn't allow the private, the profiting off of uh, collect, uh, collect calls anymore um, from prisons. But in uh, California, eliminating juvenile uh, fines and fees is an amazing step forward in recognizing that people who can't work can't pay back this debt. Legally, they can't work children in certain ages, up to certain ages, um, so that it does not make sense to impose this debt on them. Um, so states are moving forward by eliminating you know, discretionary fines and fees or things like that. Washington, with the 1783 um, bill, now set a standard for indigents. And so with certain, particularly regards to mental illness, um, that people cannot be, have discretionary fees imposed. But I, I, I still sort of argue that Right now, you know, if you think of my, my son's coloring book and he colors within the lines, I still think that people are just using a different color crayon to color within the lines, and we're not yet erasing the lines. Um, and that's what I think we need to do. I think we need to sincerely start from scratch and remove think through and map out all of the fiscal barriers for individuals that prolong their punishment and recreate a system that allows people to to be treated as human. Um, that allows them to be successful and not have these financial hurdles for the rest of their lives. 
Well, that sounds like a pretty admirable goal. Professor Harris, I, I want to thank you so much for, for making the time to join us today. Oh, sure. It was really nice to talk with you. That was Alexis Harris. She is a professor of sociology at the University of Washington and the author of the 2016 book from the Russell Sage Foundation, A Pound of Flesh, Monetary Sanctions as Punishment for the Poor. For more information about this episode, you can visit our website. That's uh, courtinnovation.org slash newthinking. For their help today, I'd like to thank two of my colleagues here, Yolen Menard and Katie Crank. And I'd also like to thank Lindsay Smith at Brooklyn Defender Services. This show is edited and produced by me. You can find me on Twitter at Didactic Matt if you have any feedback to share. Technical support is from the resonant Bill Harkins. Our director of design is Samiha Mia. Our VP of outreach is Emma Dayton. Our theme music is by Michael Aaron at QuiverNYC.com. And our show's founder is Rob Wolf. This has been New Thinking from the Center for Court Innovation. I'm Matt Watkins. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.